What an amazing service. And I thank the Lord for the unity that is in this house. And I understand that for some it is a different type of worship experience. But it is what pleases God. And it is biblical. It is scriptural. And I said it a moment ago in the moment, but God is not looking for spectators. We did not come to watch. We came, although there are times when, when that is a season of life or perhaps we're new to this experience and that's okay. But God wants our full participation in what His Spirit is doing. And now more than ever, we need to be engaged in the moving of the Spirit of God because this is no day and hour to miss out on what the Lord is doing and wants to do in each and every one of our lives. I want to take this opportunity once again to say thank you for every guest that is here into this faithful church family. We are excited. We are on the move. This is a unique season that we have long labored for, prayed for, fasted for, and we have sacrificed to see God bring us to this point in the journey. And I believe that we're in a place where many are getting on board, not necessarily to the POM, but to what God is doing in this city and among this people. And I do believe that God is looking for a people where He can show Himself mightily, a place that He can inhabit, and a place that will show forth His praises as we give Him glory. Exodus chapter 3, and then I'm going to take you to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, and then Exodus 16. And uh, for those of you that are familiar, I'm sure you will recognize the scriptural setting. Uh, but I do believe that God is going to talk to us this morning. And I believe that each of us, myself included, will be presented with an opportunity to take steps to move into what God has already prepared for us. Exodus chapter 3 reads, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. There is such great comfort in that, knowing that God knows our sorrows, and no doubt we've all had our fair share of sorrows. But God said, I know their sorrows, and I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and all the other ites that I'll skip over for sake of time. Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is spoken to the generation that came out. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. It's a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Now catch this. It is a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. You'll never have to ration. You'll never have to measure. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. Oh, for that place in our lives, in Christ, where we never ever want for anything. For the Lord is our shepherd, and we shall not want. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. And when you have eaten and are full, then shalt thou bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Exodus 16. Verse 2 and 3. And the whole congregation of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Pastor, why did you lead us to this place? And the children of Israel said unto them, Moses and Aaron, Would to God that we had died by the hand of of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and we did eat bread to the full for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger it's like what a difference what contrast between the promises that were declared and the perspective of those to whom God was making 
such declarations. And I want to minister this morning. I want to minister. I want our hearts to be open to the word. And I want to minister from this subject point of view, the exodus factor. The exodus factor. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The exodus factor. The Lord appeared to Abram in Genesis 12. And as he addresses Abraham or Abram, he said this to him. He said, I will make of you a great nation. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. And you're going to be a blessing to anyone who's ever privileged to meet you, know you, come in contact with you. In other words, Abram, your life is going to become so full that everyone you ever encounter is going to leave and depart blessed. God made a covenant to him to give him the land of Canaan, but not to him only, but to his seed that would come after him. And God then, just one chapter later, he challenges Abram to stretch his natural vision across the landscape in every direction possible. And he said, if you can see it, I'm going to give it to your seed. And he said then that Abram, wherever the soles of your feet trod, wherever you dare to go, I am going to deed the land to you and yours. And it is going to be a permanent possession to your family. God caused, just two chapters beyond that, he caused Abram to strain at the dust of the earth and to stare at the skies of the sky or the stars of the sky. And he stated that your seed would far exceed both of these illustrations in number. And yet, every promise spoken, whether seen in the natural or through a spiritual lens, every promise and every vision was predicated upon one key factor, and that was Abram had to leave. Because just one verse prior to these audacious declarations in what God was going to do in Abram's life. He said to him, get you out of your country. Get out from your kindred and from your father's house. Everything that God revealed possible in Abram's and his family's future was riding upon his obedience to get out because until he got out he could never go in to the promises that awaited him in other words until he left the land in which he was he could not enter into the land that God was wanting to show him I submit to you and I this morning as I lay a foundation for the next few moments that as is important is the act of entering is the act of exiting. It is very important to enter into all that God has and all that the book promises but just as important is the act of exiting and thus God in dedicates an entire book of the Bible accordingly the book of Exodus which simply means the leaving or the exiting now one in the same is just as critical just as spiritual and just as holy if you will as the other because the truth is this that you cannot have one without the other you cannot enter without first exiting you cannot it is the law of physical existence and we understand it in its simplicity yet it is so profound in its spiritual application it is impossible for you and I to go to Florida without leaving Louisiana 
We cannot ski on the slopes of Colorado without first leaving the borders of this southeastern Louisiana land in which we live. We understand that, that we can't be at lunch right now and we can't dine in our favorite restaurant because right now for the time being we are here at 625 Lotus Drive North and you cannot be in two places at once. And so as we fast forward into the future, we see that Abram's seed was, as prophesied, they were a stranger in a foreign land. God said to them, or to Abram, that they would serve. The seed of Abram would serve them and be afflicted for 400 years. Which means this, that generation after generation because we look in the Bible and we, we're going to go there in a moment to a generation where we know the details of the affliction but we know that generations previously they slowly had to adapt to the affliction and over time the affliction has, was no longer abnormal because it was all that they would ever know life to be like and yet it was absurd when we think about it that for 400 years they lived believing that that's all there was to life. And so in contrast to the future possibilities and promises that lied ahead, it was an absurdity. And yet they grew comfortable in their confined lives. They were restricted. They were bound. Let me tell somebody today. Day. They may have felt uh, and you may feel like it's freedom because if you remember they were planted in Goshen, the best of the land. Uh, life was pretty good at first uh, but it's over time uh, that if we're not careful, freedom uh, can, uh, bondage can feel like freedom and though they felt like they were free for a period of time, they were literally in bondage uh, and they learned to live uh, within the limitations of the land that God God had led them to and sadly millions millions sadly in generations previous had never been given the chance to be set free think about that never 400 years and previous generations never had the opportunity think about your family and my family think about the generations gone by that perhaps they did not have exposure and the opportunity that you and I are sitting in right this moment today the opportunity to live this life that God is calling us to live and so in Exodus chapter 1, we see that now Joseph and his brothers and all their generation, the original 70 that went into Egypt, they are no longer alive. They're gone. They're deceased. And the Bible says that in Egypt, after Joseph's death, there rose up a new king over Egypt. And he realizes as he looks out over his new realm, he realizes that this is a people that is fruitful, a people that is increasing abundantly, a people that is multiplying and they're exceeding mighty. They had learned to survive and even to a degree thrive in a land of bondage and so he understands the future potential and begins to afflict them with their burdens and make their lives bitter as a result of the hard bondage that would come upon them and here we see another generation going by I think of it as an onion that is being peeled it's another layer of generation coming off and then rising to the surface and again they have become acclimated to their suffering of enslavement the harsh environment and the abuses that were being inflicted upon them and this generation was gradually conditioned to deal with the pain and the sorrow of their being enslaved and every now and again as we as we can all I'm sure attest life has a way of allowing us to feel soothed and so they were soothed by the free fish and they learned to settle by living off of the spices of the land rather than the milk and the honey that awaited them. 
And then we see in the, again another generation goes by. And Moses has been wandering for 40 years. And now finally the generation. The generation that is on the cusp. The generation for whom God came down. Israel's sigh pierces the skies because of their bondage. And their cry comes up before God. And he hears their groanings. And he remembers going all the way back 430 years beyond he remembers his covenant with Abraham. The Bible, the psalmist David said in Psalm 119, because let me just say this to us. We all don't just wake up one day and decide we're going to give our lives to Jesus Christ and live for God. You and I may think that that's the way it happened. But I promise you, as the scripture said, God knows our sufferings. And God also know, knows what awaits us in the future based upon his promises being revealed in our lives. And the psalmist said it like this. And I echo this personally this morning. He said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. I don't, I don't know if you've come to the point yet on your journey where you can thank God for the previous affliction in your life. Where you can thank God for the pain. Where you can thank God for taking out the comfort in your life and removing the feathers in your nest. I thank God for the affliction that came. I thank God for the evil that encroached upon my life. I thank God that things didn't work out according to my plan. I thank God he didn't let me get back on my feet and prosper when I wanted to, trying everything I knew to do to get a grip on my life and to succeed and to prosper. I thank God for the affliction and the difficulty and the trouble because sometimes, sometimes it is the chaos that becomes the catalyst that God uses to set us free. You see, sometimes uh, for some of us, we question why are things going on in our lives the way they're working out right now. Perhaps it's what brought you to this place today and this church this morning. But sometimes life has to wreck our world in order for us to appreciate and desire living an upright life before God. Sometimes the pain has to become so severe that we crave peace. I, I don't know know maybe if you can relate to this but my father was such a person that he did not know how to live in peace he couldn't live in peace he couldn't embrace peace and every time things were peaceful and settled down he had to stir up chaos because he had only known from all of his days how to thrive when things were chaotic when the pressure was on when his world was crumbling when things were falling apart and there are people believe this or not that literally literally they create chaos because it's become what they are conditioned to living in and I'll say it like this sometimes and I know those of you that have been around a little bit you may can appreciate this more than others but sometimes things have to become so hellish in our lives until we can appreciate truly striving to live a life of holiness a life of holiness a life of holiness, a life that God guards, not a life of isolation from the rest of the world, but a life of insulation. Don't feel bad for us Pentecostals that choose to live a life of holiness. We're not trying to isolate from the world. We're not trying to tell you that we're better than you. God is insulating us because let me tell you this, that immodesty and all that goes along with it will always lead to, to immorality and God in the separating of our lives when they become so hellish we look and we reach out and have a deeper appreciation for holiness hallelujah let me let me tell you I, 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 I've come to the place and I'm so grateful that I'm comfortable in my own skin that I don't wake up in the morning and wish I was still doing this or doing that no 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 it's not a matter of what we can do we can walk out of here and do anything we want to do but it's what we choose to do because our lives were so entrenched in hell and it was encroaching and the evil 
and the chaos that God delivered us from. And so God sees like he does in so many of our lives. He sees the affliction and the restriction of the lives that we have learned to live in and survive through. And he hears the cry and he knows their sorrows and I'm thankful for a God of compassion. And this is what he said to them. He said, I am going to take you out of that land. And I am going to bring you into a good land and a large land. I don't want you to live limited lives. I don't want you to learn how to thrive in the boundaries that are restricting you. There's a land out there that I want to show you. And I want to bring you into that flows with milk and honey. I want to tell somebody, let me tell you, this is not a fable. There is a land that God has prepared. There is a place in your life where you can literally live off and live in a land that flows with milk and honey let me tell you peace can be yours now and forevermore you can find purpose you can feel fulfilled you can experience the exhilaration of living out God's desired purpose for your life but before they could ever enter the new I'm speaking of Israel those in bondage they had to exit the old and for that to occur they would have to cross the Red Sea to get out and they would have to cross the Jordan to enter in and that is what I am calling this morning for sake of my subject the exodus factor the only way to enter in is to exit out it is the exodus factor the only way they could have come out was to cross the Red Sea. And I'm here to tell somebody today who is in the throes of decision that you and I, we may have to cross some things to come out before we can ever enter in. There are those of us in the valley of decision that we may have to cross through the riptides of some old theologies, of some old beliefs, of some old systems of thought. We may have to cross through the undercurrents of family traditions and of beliefs of those that have gone before us. Hallelujah. We may have to cross swords with some old practices and patterns of living and ways of life. And we may even come to the place like we did where you have to cross some people off of your list because the Bible says says that evil communications corrupt good manners and everyone is not going to be excited about you crossing through the Red Sea into the promises that await. Now if they want to come great but if they're going to become anchors and they're going to become weights that cause you to sink and to lose out on salvation, then you've got to cut the line and you've got to cross some people perhaps off of your list. And there are times that we've got to cross lines and just finally once and for all leave some things behind. It was Peter who wrote in 1 Peter 2 and 9. He said that we should show forth our praises of him who hath called us out of darkness. Let me tell you, when you're living in darkness, you don't realize it's darkness. The only way you realize it's darkness is to be exposed to the light. And I can't tell you how many millions of people have learned to live in utter darkness. They don't even realize their life has become a constant sense of groping and feeling their way through just to stand and stay alive and until you expose yourself to light or greater light you don't even realize that you're in darkness but he said unto him who's called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light and that sounds like one exchange it sounds like one movement and one action but in fact it is not because God is calling us out but we must first be willing to come out. There is a difference between being called and coming. Abraham get out but Abraham had to obey the command and actually arise and leave. 
Jesus came to Peter. He passes by he and Andrew. He said, come and follow me. And in order for these men to become disciples, they had to drop their nets. They could not drag their nets behind them and follow Jesus. He said, come. And the decision was not God's. The decision was theirs. They literally had to get out of their boats and leave them behind along with their old life if they were going to choose and follow him. And here is the truth that if they chose not to leave, then they couldn't come. When we look at 2 Corinthians 6 and 17, Paul tells us, writing and penning the words, he said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Now, now we look at that and those of us that have heard this a little while, perhaps we've heard it preached in certain contexts, we, we cringe because we know what's coming next from the preacher. We know that it means a, a life of separation, a severing from worldliness, a life of holiness, and embracing some things that are going to be uncomfortable because sadly, so many, even Christians, we learn to be comfortable with the unclean in life. We've become comfortable with the, own, with the unclean. We, we're living in a world that, that tries to Christianize the unclean and make us feel like it's okay to hold on to it and it's okay to stay and it's okay to do and it's okay to live certain ways. But he said, come out from among them. And so I ask us today, what are those things that are holding you and I back? And perhaps though it feels like freedom, it's bondage. What are some things that we have to come out from? I, I can tell you that when I finally made my cry and it came up before God and he came down to deliver me and deliver my wife, there were some things we had to cross and there were some things that we had to come out from. Ha, ah, what's holding us back? What's holding us back? Now, most of you are looking at me like, like, like you don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm just going to tell you right now, we have addictions that hold us back. We have, we have habits that are holding us back. There are some things we have to come out from. You can't be a Christian and you can't be an alcoholic. You got to come out from some things. You got to put the drugs down. You got you, you to gotta prevent and, and separate from the promiscuity. You've got to sever from the old land if you're going to enter into the new land, oh yeah, we had to put some things down. We had to turn some things off. We had to break some records, burn some CDs. We had to sell some cigar paraphernalia. We had to empty out some expensive alcohol. There were some things in our lives that we had to come out from. Now notice he said from among them, and if you read it contextually, he's talking about people. Because birds of a feather flock together. And you'll come to a point while you're striving to be holy that your habits will clash with the people that want to hold you back rather than see you go and enter in. And I'm telling you, there are things that are in our lives that we have to choose and decide. Are we going to come out from them or not? Everyone, I don't care where you are in your journey, whether you're a new convert, whether you're here for the first time, or whether you decide that you, you, you've been living for God a long time, I'm going to tell you there is going to come a moment. There will be a line that you must cross if you choose to come out so that you can enter in. It was Peter that again the Lord said to him, he said, Peter, he said, get behind me. He said, get behind me, Satan. He said, you're an offense to me. Why did Peter become an offense to him? He's following him. He left everything behind. Why did he become an offense to Jesus Christ? Because he said to him, he said, Peter, you're savoring the things of the world. You're not savoring the things that be of God. You cannot have a, a dual appetite. You cannot hunger and thirst for the things of God and the things of the world. You cannot eat at the table of the devil all week long and then come and dine at the table of the king on Sunday and Wednesday. You cannot do it. I don't care who you are, how you spiritualize it. You cannot do it. And he said, Peter, you, you're not getting it. You're savoring the things that be of men, not the things that be of God. And then watch what he says after that. And she says unto 
his disciples. If any man, he's reminding Peter, I gave you the invitation to come and you chose to follow. But if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Because there are going to be some crosses in our life. Some things we have to cross. And that means sometimes some new things that we have to learn to carry. But he said, whosoever shall save his life will lose it because you cannot do both there must be the exodus factor active in our lives if we're going to enter into what God has and he said so if you try to save your life you're going to lose it if you try to stay in bondage and you try to succeed and prosper and live out the plan of God in bondage you can't do it you'll lose your life but if you'll lose your life and walk away and separate from everything that has you in bondage you will find your life you will save your life You'll save your life. And I'm preaching to some people this morning who are in the valley of decision. And, 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 and you have to decide, not here, not right now, but you will come to that place if you've not already gotten there where you cannot stay in bondage and enter into the promised land. You cannot be in two places at once. And so they finally come, this next generation, because you know what's so sad? I'm reading next in Joshua. But you know what's so sad? That whole, think about this, that whole generation that God said, I heard their cry and I came down to deliver them and bring them in. They died in the wilderness. They caught the attention of heaven. He descends. He sets them up for salvation. And they died in the wilderness, that entire generation, with a promise that there was a land that flowed with milk and honey for them to enter into. And so now God raises up this next generation under the command of Joshua. And they approach Jericho. Perhaps you know the story and know it well. Perhaps you don't. But they are now going to conquer the land of Canaan. And as they approach and as they, they come to that city, they, they come and encounter a woman by the name of Rahab. Now Rahab understands what's going on in her world. Rahab has read the headlines. She has not buried her head in the sand. She understands the impending consequences of what's about to happen to her world and to her city and to all that she loves and all that she's ever known. And so she looks at the spies and her world, she realizes, is about to fall apart. Literally, it's about to crumble right before her. And as these spies are coming, she turns to them knowing what is on the horizon. She said, please, she said, would you please, since I have been kind to you, will you show kindness to me and my father's house? When you come back, will you please spare and save alive my family and deliver our lives from death? And these spies look at her. Because it's a do or die moment. It is an exodus moment right now for Rahab. And they look at her. And I love this one phrase. Because I put myself in this scripture text. And I realized the moment where I had to make the same decision. And the men answered her. As she is looking for an extension of kindness and goodwill, the men look at her and said this, our lives for your life. In other words, Rahab, if you're ever going to get out of this, if you're ever going to survive, if you don't want to die, there's got to be an exchange of your life for our life. You've got to be willing, Rahab, to walk away from everything you know, everything you've experienced, everything that has shaped your world because it's about to crumble. I'm just going to tell you right now, this born-again experience, we are not going to see a little God sitting on a cloud out holding a teddy bear and just extend this Christian kindness to this world. There is impending judgment coming on this world. You and I better be aware. We better have our head out of the sand. Let me tell you, if you don't think this world's about to crumble, baby, you better hold on and understand the consequences of where we're living. 
And it's not just going to be this Christianized extension of kindness. When you come back and destroy everything around us, will you just keep us alive? Will you just pass over my home? They said, no, no, no. It is going to be an exchange of life because that's what salvation really is. Jesus said, if you hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you'll give me your life completely and fully, you'll save it. It's the exchange of life. And let me just say this here. There are no partial exchanges. There are no partial exchanges. She couldn't have said, hey, you know, take, just take these pieces and parts, but leave me here. There, there's no way of escape in a partial exchange. Again, it's the law of physical existence at play. We can't be two places at once. It's an exchange, our life for your life. This, this is what they were saying. Okay, Rahab, if you want to survive, it's our God in exchange for your gods. It, it, it's, it's our lifestyle, Rahab. If you want to come with us, it's our lifestyle in exchange for your lifestyle. It, it's our customs and traditions. Much like Ruth, if you want to follow us and you want to live in the land of promise, it's our customs and traditions in exchange for yours if you want to make it out. It's our beliefs for your beliefs. It's our way of worship for your current way of worship. It's our culture for your culture. It's your altars that are dedicated to the pagan gods of the world for our altars that are dedicated to the God of heaven. It is our sacrifices for yours, our standards of living for yours. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot have it both ways. But let me just tell you that we live sometimes under the false premise that we look and say, you know what? I still want to hold on to my life. You see, my life and Melinda's life, it was at the point where we were willing to say, you know what, I'll give you my life. I'll give you the pain. I'll give you the betrayal. I'll give you the sorrow. I'll give you the loneliness. I'll give you the depression. I'll give you the mess and the chaos that have become our life. Give us your life. I looked to a people. She looked to a people that were peaceful, a people that loved God, a people that were holy, a people that were righteous, a people that prayed and worshiped. Something we so desperately wanted. But if you look, you'll never make the exchange if you think your life is better than our life. <laughs> Rahab didn't need to feel bad for the spies. They were going to be doing the conquering. They were about to occupy that entire land. And so she could have looked and said, oh, you poor pitiful Pentecostals. Look at the way you have to live. And she knew and understood, no, 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 no. I'm willing, I'm willing to let go of my life. I've had enough trouble for one lifetime. I'm tired of learning how to live in chaos and keep my head above water and struggling, trying to do it my own way. And you and I, we have to get to that place where we're willing to say our life for your life hallelujah and look what the scripture said it said by faith the harlot Rahab watch she did not perish why because she did not perish with them that didn't believe she separated company she severed from the belief systems that caused everyone else but her family to perish and I ask you rhetorically do you think it was worth it do you think she thought, and just days later when they came back and those walls of Jericho fell, do you think that she thought, I made a good exchange? You may not see it right now. It may be odd. It may be strange. It may not seem like it's coming. But I promise you, brothers and sisters, uh, there's going to come a day you'll say, thank God I gave up my life. Thank God I walked away from my struggle. Thank God I left the addiction behind. Thank God. Thank God I stopped going there. Thank God I stopped running with those people. Thank God I severed. Thank God I became faithful. Thank God I became a tither. Thank God I was born again of water and spirit. Hallelujah. It's coming a day. It's coming a day. Our life for yours. And she didn't perish with them that didn't believe. Now, as I come to a close as quickly as I can, there is no doubt that this process is painful. There's no question that this is a painful process. 
Because there is a huge difference between exiting and entering. And there is a time, a wilderness in between. And so they make, they make the decision and they choose to exit. But now in the wilderness, when they have time to consider their, the result of their actions, they now all of a sudden start to question because of what they've been separated from. And they turn to Moses and say, why did you bring us out here to die? And there may be some couples here that are looking at each other in private, in secret. Because let me tell you, when we drove away on July the 2nd, 2000, and God filled me with the Holy Ghost, my wife said, you know, well, I, I just don't know. I mean, maybe we'll try some other churches. I said, no, 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 we're not going anywhere else. And she, she probably looked at me and didn't say these words, but was probably thinking to herself many times and on several occasions, why did you bring me out here to die? I wanted to exit the things that were holding us captive and the bondage that we were living in, but I did not want to enter into all of this. And they're saying, why, why did you bring us out here to die? Because the reality of regret is real. And there is a huge disparity between deciding to exit from the bondage that holds us captive and the dynamic of altogether is, is altogether different when it comes to entering into what awaits. And I cannot tell you over, over the almost 17 years of pastoring, the people that in the moment the pain, pleasure principle is at play and the pain is so great and they want an escape at any cost and they make the exit but they soon find themselves in the wilderness of life and in the time of transition and they don't, although they found the courage to exit, they never truly make and find the courage to enter in to all that God has for them. And if every family, if every person, if every soul were here today that died in the wilderness, there is no telling. We would need three or four of these buildings and or services to house them all because that's a reality. You know what the sad thing is with all those promises of Deuteronomy? The land that was large, that flowed with milk and honey. The place where God was going to multiply everything. He was First of all, He was going to give it to them for free. And then He was going to just multiply. Everything they possessed was going to only continue to be blessed and multiply. And be continued to be, to be increased. And with all of that out there. And with a sure word of prophecy from God. They literally died in the wilderness for sake of not being able to enter in and make the exchange, our life for yours. And before you know it, they were swallowed up in the valley of decision. And in Acts chapter 7, this is what it said of that generation. The generation that God delivered out of bondage. This is what it said. To whom our fathers would not obey. The only way Abraham gets out is obedience. The only way Israel gets out in the first place is obedience. But they said to whom our fathers would not obey. And I, I, I want you to just get this. I know it seems so unfathomable to each of us. But it says, but thrust him from them. The God that came down to deliver and save them. Who brought them out through a mighty hand through the Red Sea. They turned in the wilderness and thrust him away from them. You brought a little peace in my life, God. You brought a little order. You brought a little restoration. Now get away from me. I got it from here. Now get away from me, God. I don't, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to not be able to do those things. I don't want to not be able to talk like that and live like that and carouse like that. Get away from me, God. I don't want to enter in. I wanted the exit, but I didn't want the entrance. And I look at families out here today, and I won't go to call the names, but I see a lot of new young families, and I understand the pain of the process. 
And I understand how me and my wife, literally, it was painful. There were days and nights and moments in time where as much as we loved this life that, that we were being exposed to and the people that we were falling in love with it and this God that we were learning about, there was the reality of the pain of separating from our old life and everything that was who we had previously been. I, I can remember driving to church and screaming at the top of my lungs in my head because, you see, it's a new identity. It's the identity for Christ, for the identity that the world gave us. And I can remember screaming at the top of my lungs, Don't these people know who I am? And I was nothing. And I was no one. I was lost in a foreign land and in the wilderness. There was no pastoral office. There was no sure calling. There was no pulpit. There was no title. There was no congregation. There was no full-time ministry. There was no nothing. And I'm screaming in the wilderness. Yeah, we exited out. But do we really want to enter in fully? You see, God, God, they pushed them away and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. And there are some places that await us. And I talk to every one of us today. Whether you're a new convert, new to this, or you've been around forever, and this is the only thing you know, there are still places that await us if we're willing to leave where we are this morning. God will always call us to come, to move, to follow, to enter into a life beyond where we're living. Blessings instead of bondage. But it's always up to you and me whether or not we will activate, activate the exodus factor. If they would have said, we're not leaving Egypt, but God give us all this, it's no deal. They had to leave the old land to enter into the new. And so many of us, we desire change. We long for something better, something new, but so few are willing to leave the comforts of what we call here. We want to grow, but we don't want to let go. We want to be increased, but we don't want to sow. And the scripture tells us that we cannot pour new wine into old wineskins. And there are so many that die in the wilderness trying. You know, one of the things I love about what God did is that when they crossed through the Red Sea that he opened wide, he created this beautiful passageway to lead them out to the land of promise. But once God brought them on the place in the journey where he wanted them, the walls that became the corridor through that sea, they crashed. And everything of their past, everything that tormented them and inflicted pain, and everything that they were trying to escape drowned. And God never left access to Egypt available again. And I cannot tell you the people that God will bring through that Red Sea baptized in Jesus name filled with the Holy Ghost because we are in type the church and our salvation is in type the journey of Israel they crossed through the sea and lived under the cloud and I can't tell you the, in, the, 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 the untold numbers that though they came through the sea and they've lived under the cloud they're trying to swim their way back across those seas back to Egypt and you'll never make it you'll never make it and so many died trying as you stand with me this morning. The Apostle Paul tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It's not instantaneous. There must be the application of the exodus factor. He said, All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new but not until we walk away from those old things and exit in order to enter into that new life and the newness that awaits us. And so I don't know who you are today. 
I don't know. I can only I can only surmise that there are so many of us at different junctures in the journey. Perhaps this week, you and your spouse, you had conversations. Perhaps like me, you've already openly declared things you won't do. Can I tell you, this is so crazy. This is so crazy. No one was saying a word to me, and I was leaving church, and I was telling Melinda, nobody's going to make me not drink. Nobody said anything about drinking. But I was mad on the way home saying, nobody's going to tell me I can't have a daiquiri. Nobody's going to tell me I can't smoke a cigar. Nobody even talked about that. You know why? Because we all know those inner convictions. We all know those things that we have to cross and be willing to step away from. And can I tell you, 21 years and five days, I'm five days away. We are five days away from 21 years since our crossing. And there is not one. Now, did we go through the pain of the wilderness? Yes. Was it strange exchanging our life for theirs and learning a new way of life? Yes. Is it easy to adapt to new culture and customs and worship and altars and all? No, it's not easy. But I can tell you this. When you embrace and enter into everything that God has and you let go of what was, I promise you, you will be in store. God will take you on a journey and an adventure that you will never look back and ever, ever, ever regret. But it, you can't keep, your, your, your feet are not wide enough to keep one foot in Egypt and stretch, the all the way other, stretch all the way to the other and promise. You just can't do it. It's the exodus factor. And everyone has to come to that point in place on their own. So this morning, I simply, as an altar call, I simply say, come. Come and cross whatever you need to cross to get to where God is wanting to bring you and to do whatever God is wanting to do in your life. I was fussing over not being able to drink a daiquiri. You couldn't give me anything like that right now in exchange for this life that God has given me. The blessings, the peace, the joy, the purpose, the thrill, the love, the relationships. that I cross some people off my list? Yeah, but I wouldn't trade a one of them for any of these rich relationships that we now enjoy. There is nothing that I want to go back and pick up again in Egypt. I'm talking to somebody today. you got to make your mind up. You may not understand it all. That's okay. Just walk in obedience until you can gain the knowledge and be instructed in the things of God. Is it scary to let go? Yes. Is it worth it? Yes. Hallelujah. Is there a risk? Yes. But is there a greater reward? Yes. I'm telling somebody today that the exodus factor is your next step in the journey. And you can be in this all your life. There are new levels. There are greater dimensions. We'll never keep our comforts and cross over into the great things that God has in store. Church, as they sing, let's worship. Let's talk to God. He's already called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. But you and I, we have to come. We have to come out. And nobody can force us out. We have to come out. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise team, lead us. Come on, let's make up our minds. Let's make up our minds. This is going to be a crossing, a crossing moment for some people today. This is going to be a do or die day for so many of us today. Whatever you've got to do, you can't enter in until you first exit. Hallelujah. Let go of every weight. Release from the sin that does so easily beset us. In the name of Jesus. I'm not going back. Darren, I'm not going back. Ryan, I'm not going back. You can't force me back. Whitney, I'm not going back. Allison, I ain't going back. There's no other life for me. I'm not making a return on my purchase. So I'm not going back. Not doing it. Not doing it. 
I made an exchange. Your life, Pentecostals, for my life. And I was happy to drop my life to take up your life. I'm not doing it, Lord Day. I'm not doing it. Make fun of me. Think I'm poor and pitiful. Feel bad for me that I can't do what the world is doing. But I ain't going back. I'm glad I'm not drinking. I'm glad I'm not smoking. I'm glad I'm not doping. I'm glad I'm not cussing. I'm glad I'm not lying. Hallelujah. I'm not going back. I'm glad I'm modest. I'm glad I'm striving to be holy. I thank God for the anointing. I thank God for the privilege to serve Him. I thank God for the purpose and calling of God. I thank God for ministry. Hallelujah. I thank God for His blessings. I'd be dead broke today if it wasn't for the blessings of God. I'd be living on the street somewhere if it wasn't for the blessing of God. Hallelujah. Jesus. Right now. Right now is the moment. Today is the day. Right now. You can be changed and make the exchange. Right now, Eric. Right now. I've been waiting. 